Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Grow uh, of uh, Startup Jungle. Kind of messed up on that. Um, but uh, my name is Lo Silva, and I have Travis Ketchum here with me. He is the founder of Contest Domination. Hey. Um, Contest Domination is a web uh, software as a service that you can use to uh, create awesome contests online. Travis, what's up, man? Hey man, good to be here. It's uh, actually sunny in Seattle today, so. <laughs> nice. You're you're based out of Seattle. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the the beautiful Northwest. Nice. Yeah, I'm uh, in Orlando. It's it's ridiculously hot in here already. So it's, <laughs> it's tough weather over here. But um, yeah, man. So kind of wanted to um, you know, like we talked a little bit earlier. Um, kind of just go a little bit more conversational with it and stuff like that. And why don't you tell everybody a little bit of uh, how you got started? Uh, and how you created Contest Domination, because I think that's a pretty cool story. Sure. So, I mean, just as some background, you know, I, I went through the, the entrepreneurial phase as a kid, just like everyone else. Um, went to college, got a little distracted, as will happen. <laughs> After college, got a real job. Um, decided very, very quickly that uh, the cubicle life and the, uh, the kind of metrics that weren't necessarily performance-oriented just weren't for me. I had a, a big drive of, you know, if the numbers say if we're doing well, then we're doing well. If they say we're not doing well, then we're not. Um, so that only lasted about nine months. And then I went out on my own to uh, help out some best-selling authors and speakers and do their run their JV programs and affiliate programs and and help them do some media buying, uh, like a bunch of bunch of spend on LinkedIn ads and that kind of thing. Uh, but I knew that to really be successful, I needed to a have my own product. And B, I didn't have a list of my own, and so it was sort of like the shoemaker's kids have no shoes. And so I needed to find a way to quickly sort of grab that initial audience. And I looked around the web, and I saw that uh, contests were a great way to sort of suck the air out of a market and get the get attention into your space. And had really high conversion rates, had you know great viral lift on the back end. But the key missing component there was that at the time, several years ago, my impression was that most of the contest uh, platforms out there existed for the sole purpose of just being a contest, not for the sole purpose of being a contest for lead generation specifically. And so there's a few things that you can do differently on the back end mechanics of that to make it really oriented. And so I, I scrimmed and scrounged and begged and bartered and, and worked with some uh, different WordPress developers, some good, some bad, to uh, scrape together my first product, spent about... Uh, 7,500 bucks, you know, after a few failures and uh, for, the, for the product, the sales copy, that kind of thing, uh, ha over half of which was on a credit card. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking like really, really scrimping by. Um, ran, a, ran a contest myself, did actually surprisingly well, better than I even thought I could. Uh, I was like, wow, great, there's some legs to this, we have some metrics, we have a story we can tell. Turned around, launched that as a WordPress product, you know, did well over six figures. Um, over a course of a few months uh, on that product and then immediately turning that into a SaaS product by starting over, but we knew we had some momentum, some branding, um, and that really put us in a position to build a more long-term sustainable business, and now we do in revenue every few days what my original startup cost was, so <laughs> it's uh, it's really come a long way. Not bad, not bad. Yeah, it's, it's, it's cool to hear your story because, you know, we come a little bit from the internet marketing world and, you know, we, we hear of people that make awesome things and they do make, you know, a, a quick six figures in, in a product launch and, and things like that, which most in most cases, if you take that to like the SaaS world, they don't, that's not normal. You know, hey, yeah, we figured this thing out and we set up a landing page and, you know, they're like, oh, we got 5,000 people for free. And we're like, yeah, we made 100 grand. <laughs> I mean, it's so it's so different, you know. But the 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 mentality also shifts where uh, a person more in the startup space is always, yeah, we're scaling this, we're making it big. And a person more in the internet marketing world is saying, hey, yeah, I already made my money, I'm out, I'm building something new. And it's cool that you actually stuck to it and built a legitimate business through it. Yeah, I mean, what we decided to do is, is you know, in effect, we actually did build something new, but we decided that instead of doing the hit and run, hit and run, hit and run, and and sort of abandoning products, you know, every product we've ever sold, we always support for at least a year. Yeah, That's our guarantee to our customers, regardless of how well or not well the product is done. <clears throat> Obviously, in our new current product, since it's a, it's a subscription, 
we can support them sort of forever. Mm -hmm. um, at least that's the idea. <laughs> um, but uh, what we want to do is just sort of take that momentum, take that user feedback, take the brand, and then go back to square one and say, okay, now that we know there's traction, right, it was more of a marketing test, right? Like you said, in most startup world, uh, you know, to be 5,000 free leads, you know, we're only satisfied if we can do a promo and get 5,000 customers, yeah. you know, which is a drastically different <laughs> metric to work from. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely been our trajectory the whole time to sort of compound things that work and shed things that don't. How has that mixture of communities been for you? Because I, I know that you know people in both spaces and the vocabulary and the conversation, you know, essentially it's weird because they kind of don't respect each other. You know what I mean? The totally. The popular yeah. guys, they're like, oh, we're, you know, we, we're growth hackers, we're this and that, the, you know, the more internet marketing based people, the direct response, they're like, we've been doing what you do for, X, you know, five, six years. And we just, <laughs> You know, and so there's there's all this like kind of tension. I don't know why we all can't just get along and build even bigger things. You know what I mean? Because I think there's a lot to learn. From the the way that SaaS companies study data, normally an internet marketer does not. But the way that an internet marketer approaches uh, creating sales and direct response is something that you know the software people kind of are not really looking at that yet. Totally. I think you nailed it. I mean, we, we actually try to somewhat straddle the two marketplaces, which is probably an awkward place to be. Um, I'm there with but you. But one thing that, that we sort of believe in is that there's actually a lot of people <clears throat> who sort of coincidentally end up buying the internet marketing space mm -hmm. that are really high value leads, but the difference is you have to understand how to communicate them a, a little differently, a little more for the long game. And what I mean by that is, you know, traditionally, I would I would say if you ask sort of, you know, a random sampling of the internet marketer space, they go more for the large volume of buyers, low price point, one time fee. And if you go to the SaaS end, you usually get the other end of the spectrum, right? They want to get a large fee, you know, a recurring amount, um, and and they have like this freemium idea where if they give away a free plan, they can hopefully show and prove enough value to have them buy something better, right, and more expensive, like significantly more expensive, whereas, you know, the IM world's like dollar trial with, you know, a three-day rebuild and, you know, yeah. so, some more edgier things. And so we try to sort of blend the two models, actually. Um, we, we originally started with a free plan on our SaaS that was significantly watered down, and we found with the IM leads coming in, that was a terrible conversion rate <laughs> to go from, you know, the sort of freemium model. And so, you know, now we have this sort of structured, you, know, you get a seven-day full-featured, no credit card required trial, but then we do have some sort of things in there to where if, if you upgrade in a certain amount of time, you do get better pricing, right? And then we have uh, other things where we're deploying things like a tripwire model where we'll put something out there for an extremely low cost just to get turn a, a prospect into a buyer. All that sort of mentality is typically IM mentality, but we just ease off the gas a little bit and we can yeah. command a much higher price because of it because we're not so, you know, false scarcity, blah, 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 that you would normally find in the IM marketplace. Well, I think it's because people that have more the the IM marketplace, let's just say mentality, come from there is no there's no VC behind you. There's no oh well you know we've got revenue. Let's just hire some people and let's just do this and that. Like it's hey, how do we make money for today? Yeah, so there there's sure. got to be kind of like a direct. This is how we're doing that. And, and you know, like you said with the tripwire, which is kind of creating a low barrier entry offer to, in essence, rather than just have a subscriber, create a buyer, build that buyer relationship. Now that we've already had that, I already took my wallet out for you, you're more likely to sell me something again rather than me going out and finding another solution. So I, I you know, Absolutely. I think you're strong. I'm, I try to implement that. I advise a few uh, startups and things like that. And uh, one of the first things I'm trying to do with these guys now is saying, hey, let's create a low barrier to entry so they can kind of get to know, even if it's just a walkthrough of the software that you have, let's just create a small, even if it's a $3 webinar or if it's a $7 offer just to kind of like educate them. And it, it actually kind of starts to serve as part of like a certain kind of onboarding strategy. Totally. And you know what we actually found that the, that's crazy and blew me away? We tried giving out uh, all this course information and education materials and things that we really thought uh, people, if they, we thought if people watch this content, 
they would be so well educated at running a profitable, successful contest, right? They drew, they drew in the most qualified leads that generated them an instant ROI, like, great. We were more than happy to give that away for free, which is the sort of Silicon Valley startup mentality. It's like, well, you know, we only charge for tools. We don't charge for training, right? Whereas the IM world, um, you know, they, they charge for both, but there's a lot of money in the info space. What's weird is that when we charge just a little bit of money for that same content, our audience ignored it when it was free. And when it cost just a few bucks, not only did they change that relationship into a buyer, but now all of a sudden they have a little bit of skin in the game and they're, they're plowing through the content and realizing just how good it is, which makes them amped up and excited to actually buy and engage with our product when before we had actually tried giving the same people that same content for free and they, they totally ignored it. So it's yeah, a I mean, total nowadays, mind shift. Free has no value. It, it's, it's tough. We, I can find anything. I, I can find paid things for free. I mean, there, anything in the world is free. The information truly that you find at a paid section through a, a free section, you could probably, if you really did the research, just get all of it for free. But there's no real value in, in that. Oh, well, I'll read it later. It's there. If, if, if someone goes out and spends money and gives you that, then they gave you, you know, a big part of them, which is the, the financial transaction there. So now I have the value you know, representation of, well, this is worth X amount that I paid. I need to dig into this. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that the, the the bigger SaaS companies do wrong is that they don't value the education. Your your software is great, but if I don't know how to use it, <laughs> they're, they're, if, if I don't really truly understand the best ways to, you know, do the better, the best I can with your, with your software, then I'm just going to, you're going to have me for a month, two, churn's going to just start to, you know, get aggressive there, and there's nothing keeping me. And so the education, I think, is a, is a big, valuable part that these guys just kind of overlook. Rather, in the other sector, they go, hey, this is actually really important, and you get a tool. Well, what's funny, too, is if you look at a lot of the uh, Silicon Valley sort of, you know, startup people, they're there because they have extreme domain expertise, right? They're very, very knowledgeable what they do. Like if they decided tomorrow to stop selling software and just go be a consultant, they could command top dollar, right? We're talking huge sums of money for businesses that, that have the most value in that, whatever that niche is, right? Because they are probably one of the most educated people in the world at what they do. Right. Mm -hmm. Let's just assume that, that that's a, a large majority of the people who are in that sort of early stage team. Now, if you're giving that away for free, as you said, people aren't going to value it. You know, they could probably walk into a, you know, a, a, a scenario where a business valued it and charge, you know, thousands of dollars, right? Five thousand, ten thousand, maybe oh, you know, yeah. depending on the niche, twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars for a weekend or a week of their expertise. And yet, when it's their own business, they want to give it all away for free. And how is the end prospect supposed to know they're getting forty thousand dollars worth of fine-tuned experience and knowledge? in an applicable fashion that they can apply to their business, like hand delivered on a silver platter, if that's free, they won't know that there's any value there. You have to tell them, you know, just like in your copy, you have to tell people what you want them to do. The price point tells them how much they should respect it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's talk a little bit about um, contest domination and some of the things that you guys have been uh, employing to create growth besides obviously generating contests for yourselves, I'm sure. Um, what what are some things that you guys have found now that you're kind of past that essential startup stage to consistently get more traction? Yeah, so, um, you know, for us, it, you know, the first thing we had to do was actually just, uh, just fine-tune that process of converting prospects into customers, which sounds really elementary, but that's something we monkeyed with sort of forever. <laughs> you know, it's, it's probably never really done, but uh, it's... Uh, the difference between now and even, say, like September is a 6x increase in customer value. So, you know, really trying different things that most people are kind of afraid to do. Mm -hmm. So, like, we changed the, the names of our plans. We totally changed our pricing schemes. Um, we changed the trial scenarios. We changed... We tested in all these different things of, of when prices increase and how much they increase and and how we message people, and all that has changed drastically many times over to sort of come to this, like, resting place of where we feel comfortable with it. Um, you know, and we didn't think we were doing 
horrendous before. We sort of were in, in hindsight, right? But we, uh, we were probably doing better than most people who just throw an app up and build something yeah. um, as a starting line. And so to go from that and increase by 6x dramatically, of course, changed the game for us. Um, but in terms of bringing in new customers, uh, we, we see a few things as sort of being the most important. Uh, first of all, and this is really applies to the internet marketing space, is we sort of obsess over customer service. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll do basically not anything, but nearly anything to get someone happy, make them happy, get them engaged, you know, even if that's, you know, we don't provide a hands-on service, but if we have to jump in and tweak things and change things for a customer, we will, uh, because word of mouth is massive for us. Yeah. And to amplify that, we built in a feature where um, when a prospect is right at the point of deciding to buy, and we don't push this beforehand anymore, right when they go to buy, we have a nice little call to action that says, do you want to save $25 instantly off of your first bill? And typically the cheapest thing we sell is 100 bucks. so if they're buying a $100 item, you know, it's a 25% discount. If it's a subscription, it's less, but it's still 25 bucks. And all we have to do is just type in five emails of their friends to invite them to try out the, our trial for our software, and they get an instant $25, and uh, you'd be sort of shocked at how many people will, will do that and, uh, you know, what the value is. Because you think, you know, cost per acquisition, right, you typically would pay, you know, $40, $80 for a conversion. Um, you'd probably pay at least 20 bucks plus for a trial. You know, we're paying five. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we're building it right in at the point where they decide to make that transaction so that we're not needlessly saying, hey, you've been in our software for three days. Don't you want to, you know, share with five friends? Like, it's not a push. It's a pull. So, like, when they're ready, we pull them into the opportunity to refer us their friends. Um, another thing that, of course, you know, in the staple is going to be affiliates. Um, it's not a huge part of our business, but when you start, you know, stacking them all together, uh, it's meaningful. Uh, and then one thing that's actually surprised me at the long tail value is by doing that initial launch, um, we actually seeded a lot, of, you know, a lot of affiliates pushed out a lot of content, um, and then we had a wide visibility. So then even people like you know about.com and Mixergy and interviews and, and you know podcasts and things like that are a great lead source for us just because we have the visibility in the marketplace. Um, and then our own content marketing where. You know, we don't do as much of it as we'd like to, just from a bandwidth perspective. Yeah. Uh, but the ability to, you know, give little, you know, one dollar Facebook ad hack kind of thing, you know, like for one dollar a day, how you can like double your visibility on your Facebook posts, that kind of stuff. Um, we find we get a lot of viral lift on the sharing of the content, which brings them back to our domain. Um, you know, brings them back into our whole content cycle, and then eventually pulls a good number of them into trials. So it's sort of a shotgun approach, but uh, that way, so out of a uh, out of all the stuff that you guys are trying and testing, what what is working out the best? Is it, and do you guys do anything like, for example, connect with uh, you know, uh, other APIs and kind of integrate or anything like that? So we do connect with APIs, and um, that's actually I'm glad you brought that up because most people in the early days, and we were sort of the same flawed mindset was, hey, if we integrate with everybody. We can get into the marketplace, you know, the add-on marketplace of everybody else, and that should drive us a ton of traffic. Now, do we get business from that? Absolutely. But the thing is, is sort of funny, you know, we integrate with Aweber, MailChimp, Infusionsoft, blah, 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 right? And Aweber even actually mailed out for us um, a how-to guide that we, we co-wrote, co-authored with them, and they promoted that to their list, but... Um, <laughs> They're not marketers, right? They're, they're email guys, they're software guys, but it sort of comes back to that they're not marketers. And so we've actually had what would be considered probably like B or C level affiliates mm -hmm. drive more traffic and certainly more sales for that amount of traffic than Aweber themselves drove. Now, of course, it's all accumulative and we're happy to be there and there's a lot of credibility that uh, comes associated with that. But uh, no single partnership is going to dramatically move the needle on your business. We found, yeah. uh, you know, maybe maybe a few, uh, you know, authority guru type figures can make that kind of impact in the early days. But now that we're sort of past that, we haven't found that any one partner is going to dramatically move the needle, say twenty percent for us. Um, you know, everyone will move it a little bit, but uh, you know, it, it's not not nearly the level you would think. 
No, yeah, it's it's the consistency of just maintaining those relationships and, you know, kind of uh, create creating an integration here and getting a few more affiliates there and, you know, jumbling that up at, at the end of the month, let's say. And that that's what kind of starts to actually move the needle, the needle which is you just creating growth by hustling, really. Totally. And I would say, you know, if someone is out there building software and they're, they're thinking about, you know, who do you partner with first, there's a, a big temptation to pick someone who you think is the biggest uh, because that you think they're going to drive you the most traffic. Yeah. And that's a huge mistake. Um, what we ended up doing is we actually, you know, we, we did the basics, MailChimp, AWeber, Infusionsoft, and only Infusionsoft because we were using them ourselves at the time. Uh, we, we still are uh, for a lot of stuff. But we, we just surveyed this big group of prospects, and we had our past WordPress customers. We said, hey, guys, look, you know, we want to prioritize based on your needs. What, you know, we had them answer two questions. A, what email service do you use? And then the second question was on a scale of 1 to 10, how likely would you be to upgrade if we added your service tomorrow? <laughs> and that helped us correlate and rank which ones, because we, you know, we were already getting some audience because we had some buzz from the prior product, but when we went into the SaaS mode, it had very, very little to do with who could we potentially barter uh, a promotion with, mm -hmm. and more to do with, hey, we have an audience, we have a little a bit of their attention right now, uh, let's just ask them. And so you know, the answer of, who uses the most may not be necessarily correlated to who's most willing to upgrade uh, as soon as. Because we actually found, you know, like by adding Office Autopilot, we actually had a fair number of conversions, even though we had way more people on, say, Constant Contact or Eye Contact that were actively using them, but they were not necessarily as likely to upgrade on our platform. So, so as you guys are growing, what uh, what bottlenecks are you having? What what's What's keeping you up at night? <laughs> um, well, at first, it just had to do with uh, pure traffic loads, just sort of the nature of contests. They're very spiky kind of traffic. It's not yeah. like tomorrow is 2% higher than today and so on and so forth. It's like, you know, the next hour is going to be 800% more activity than this hour. <laughs> yeah. And uh, in dealing with that was, was difficult. Uh, especially when we used to have an old embed widget that was really sort of an iframe, so we were our load was like a, we were not only had our own normal landing page load, but then we had you know multiple iframe or you know on on each site of like thousands of customers, and that just added overhead like crazy overnight, and it wasn't performing very well, um, and we were just on like one big dedicated host, and so it wouldn't like crash, but we would hit our bottleneck, and what would happen is uh, you know it can only you know, handle so many concurrent users, and when you get past that, it would just like it looked like it hang, was hanging. But in reality, you had sort of like taking your number at the DMV, right, and had to wait for someone else to get off before you could see it. And yeah. and that's like a nightmare scenario from my perspective. And really, literally kept me up at night as my you know uptime alerts were going insane on my phone, and I'm like ah. <laughs> um, so moving from sort of the standard scenario to like you know, a, a load balanced Linode cluster of multiple nodes uh, to handle way more traffic and it, you know, does a round robin. So as we get that avalanche of traffic from a big brand mailing, because uh, you know, now we have individual contests doing well north of 100,000 leads uh, on a single contest. And so you think even with a 60% conversion ratio, that's still, you know, one person is going to send you a quarter million visits yeah. to one page you know, in a short period of time, not to mention the other thousands of customers on there, and, and it usually comes in a compressed amount of time. So just sort of dealing with what comes with that, you know, because even after you get that, then it's like, okay, well, now a bunch of people want to export their data at the same time. So you have to have, like, duplicate database services, you know. It's like it's things that you wouldn't always think about that you need duplicate services and load balance this and and caching and just all that optimization uh, was, was really sort of a hurdle for us in the early days just because it came way sooner than we thought it would. You know, we knew eventually we'd have to get there, but we had no idea that uh, in such a short amount of time we would be you know, totally cranking the limits of, of what our platform could do. So that was probably the biggest thing that kept us up at night. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good problem. I mean, it's a problem for sure, but it's a, you know, it's a good problem to have. It's, it's better than I don't know how to get more people here. You know what I mean? Yeah, totally, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, that's, that's very, very true. But, so, uh, so a, a lot of the people that we, uh, 
you know, that we deal with and are not only just in the uh, SaaS market and bootstrappers, but a lot of them do e-commerce and, you know, are, are trying to grow their list as well. So what are um, three major things that are missing from people not doing contests? I mean, I, I can immediately, I think, you know, you're not growing your list. You're not capturing the potential of virality in contests, you know, and it's, it's, a, it's an easy way to leverage kind of like a quick growth hack, if you will. Sure. I mean, that, that's probably the most most obvious uh, aspect that people do get after they finally jump in. Um, just this week, we've had quite a few people email in and say, just want, want to let you know, I've captured more leads in the last two days than I've captured in the last three months. So you do get that sort of instant, you know, hit, you know, bump of like, wow, great, my list is growing. Yeah. But I think what's probably actually more important than that in is, is more nuanced, and it makes sense when people sort of think about it, but when they their knee-jerk reaction doesn't bring them to this conclusion, and that's that contests, when you have the right prize, are actually a fantastic pre-qualifying event to give you a reason to make an offer. So not only is it a great way for you to engage your own list in there, get the viral you know, virality on the back end of them referring their friends. Not only is it one of the highest convergences that you can possibly do when it comes to ads, plus you get the viral component again, lowering your cost per lead, but when that prize is right on the front end, when you do finally announce and give away what that prize is at the end, you have like 99.9% .9 of this list that all entered recently, recency is king, and raised their hand and said, I want that, and if the thing you gave away is very, very correlated, or maybe exactly what you do and sell, you have a list of 99.9% .9 of people who are basically telling you, I want to give you my money, right? Then it just becomes down to, do I trust you? Do I like the things you've sent me so far? You know, I think you're kind of cool for giving this away to start with, right? And now it's just like, give me a, an incentive to buy, whether that's an incentive via bonus, whether it's an incentive via discount, it doesn't matter, you have their attention, they're qualified for what you want to do, and it's one of the lowest forms of getting them into your door. It's a great time to make an offer. Yeah, so that's very, very true. And I know that you guys have a Contest 101 um, product that, that you've made, kind of going, taking everybody through the, the biggest and the, um, the hardest frequently asked questions that I know you, you constantly get asked. Um, yeah. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that. Sure. So um, what we did is we sort of distilled the things that we uh, we felt most people were missing. You know, it covers some of the basics about contests, but we also wanted to cover, you know, how to pick that right prize, how to set yourself up to make a great offer so that you can get that ROI in your campaign. Um, just the things that we, we thought someone in a day should be able to get through on content. You know, it's just like five modules. Uh, and we wanted to price it inexpensively, but we did want to price it so that people, <laughs> as we talked about early, would actually engage with the content. Yeah. And so we just called it Contest Marketing 101, and uh, that's actually at uh, prospectdomination.com slash CM101 for Contest Marketing. So we CM101. We have that in the show notes as well. Yeah, and so you know, if someone's interested in learning about you know, why contests really work, how to set up their, their offer, how to draft bigger audiences so they can really get the, the ideal audience they want for the lowest possible price, and then how to make them an offer in a non-salesy way, in a way that makes them actually excited to see a discount on something that you've already sort of given away. That's a, it's a great low-cost way to get into it. That's awesome, Travis. Well, we appreciate it. What is, uh, are, you, are you on Twitter at all? Of course. I'm uh, at Travis Ketchum, which... Uh, yeah. We, we, will, we will have the handle on on the uh, on the blog, and if you are listening on iTunes, it's Travis. I would assume K E T C H U M. Yep. U M. Cool. And guys, we are at Startup Jungle. Uh, on behalf of Travis and myself, I want to say thank you. If you guys have not downloaded our uh, mini growth hacking guide, please do so. And if you are listening to us on iTunes, please make sure you leave a review. We really appreciate it. And we want to thank you guys for listening. On behalf of myself and Travis, I want to say thanks. Uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for having me on.